Chris. Uh, yeah, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Rishi Verma, like Chris mentioned. Uh, the title of my talk today is uh, Searching for Cancer Biomarkers with Apache ODT. Um, I guess just to get a quick assessment, how many of you here don't or have never interacted with the ODT data processing components like workflow or workflow? Okay, so a couple of you. Okay, so that's great because, um, yeah, the, the point of this talk is twofold. So, first, it's to uh, introduce some of the science behind. Uh, what we're doing for a project at, at JPL called um, EDRN and um, introduce the science of cancer biomarker research and then also to give an introduction to the ODT data processing technologies like Workflow, Workflow Manager, things like that. So if you're interested in those, this is a great place to be. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, so just to be more specific about the agenda for today, uh, I'm going to just quickly start out by just telling you who I am. Um, just so that you all know me. Um, and then I'm going to go into uh, more in depth into the science behind the uh, project that we're doing and just try to give an explanation of, of how the process works. And hopefully, you'll find that interesting. Uh, then I'll be talking about Apache ODT data processing components, specifically Oracle Manager, Resource Manager, some of the PCS workflow uh, tools that we're using. And I'll, and I'll talk about what that means. And then uh, finally, I'll talk about, um, or not finally, um, fourth on the list, I'll talk about um, the, the, how we're applying those two aforementioned parts together in terms of the science and actual components that we're using to solve a real science uh, use case. And that project is called EDRN LabCAS, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And finally, the last thing, I, I sort of got all fit everything in, uh, is to give you a quick tutorial about how to get started yourself if you want to set up a data processing system, something like what we've developed. So yeah, without further ado, let me let me go ahead and start it. So uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, that's my Facebook picture. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's just me hanging on really tightly to a fence at Sequoia National Park. Uh, apart from kind of you know my personal interests, um, I work professionally as a software engineer at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and a couple of you I've, I've worked also at, at Indiana University before I started at JPL. I'm involved in a couple different projects, all revolved around similar themes. But I've been working on the Curiosity rover. Many of you have probably heard, heard about that. Um, Cancer Research, which is the project I'm going to be talking about today, um, uh, and. A couple of their um, scientific application projects where we're using data process, we're building data management systems to help uh, solve a scientific use case or provide data analysis support or data management support for different missions. So uh, a couple of those are um, the CO2 uh, uh, virtual science data system, which is another project I work on, and then also some earthquake modeling applications. There's a couple of things I'm involved in, and I also work on ODT more recently in the last year and a half uh, as a committer and um, on the project management committee for that. So that's a little bit about me, so that you know who I am. Um, let's get into more of the heart of the talk, which is a little bit about the science. Uh, so the project that, uh, uh, that we're working on at JPL is, is really focused on a scientific use case, and it's focused on trying to advance cancer research. And cancer, like many of you know, it's a, it's a disease that's been around for a long time. And it's a disease that, uh, to this day, there's no um, single kind of cure or treatment that works uh, very effectively. There are many different things people can do, but um, it, it's still a very hard problem to solve. The best that people can do is, uh, currently, is to try to detect cancer at its earliest stages and also to try to treat it at its earlier stages. So with those two ideas in mind, that's where, um, uh, that's where it, it becomes useful to talk a little bit about cancer biomarkers, which are trying to address those two topics. So cancer, bi actually, before I even talk about cancer biomarkers, let me just talk about what biomarkers are in general, just to give you an overview. So biomarkers are any kind of biological entity um, that indicates some kind of processes going on. So it's a really, it's pretty general term, actually. But it's, it essentially could mean um, uh, protein levels in, in your blood. It could mean uh, DNA uh, expression, gene expression. It could be 
any kind of um, biological entity that indicates something, uh, some kind of condition. And it's used in many different types of scientific fields. We're, we're using it you know, in the biological and medical realm. Um, it's also used, I've heard, in other uh, types of scientific applications, including geology and you know, trying to figure out where an organism, what type of organism exists, um, depending on processes that go, out, go on inside of a cell. So there's a lot of different types of use cases for, for biomarkers in general. Cancer biomarkers, as we're using them or investigate them, are um, useful because they're trying to help identify uh, cancer, like the name suggests, uh, at its most earliest stages for a different variety of cancers. So it, it's, it's a very interesting area. In the last 10, 15 years or so, there's been a lot more development and research going into this field, which makes it um, uh, an interesting field to see where it'll go in the next 10, 15 years. But there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of development going into trying to detect cancer at its early stages using biomarkers. So some facts about cancer biomarkers. Um, let me go ahead and start with just applications. So within the cancer biomarker research realm, um, it's used for three applications. So the first is screening, which means just trying to identify biomarkers in general, doing statistical analysis of what biomarkers are available and what they're what their different applications are. What we're interested in is um, early detection, which is uh, what that means is basically looking for specific types of cancer biomarkers and then relating them to different types of cancers that exist in the human body and trying to detect those. Um, so before you know, any kind of physical sign of a cancer, like a tumor or something has developed, uh, there's Small, smaller indicators that cancer might be developing, and those are not visible to the naked eye, but through different types of tests, early detection tests, people can try to identify and see if um, uh, cancer may form in, in some type of patient. Uh, the third application is treatment, and what that means is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, cancer biomarkers are any kind of biological entity used for, used for different purposes. So there's actually uses for it to um, treat some kinds of disease. Many co common types of can cancer biomarkers are proteins. So um, they can, uh, scientists and um, uh, medical practitioners can use biomarkers to try to, by increasing levels of proteins or decreasing levels of proteins, they can actually have clinical application to try to treat different types of diseases. So there's different applications for cancer biomarkers. Um, the most common types of biomarkers existing today are um, uh, proteins um, found in um, um, blood, actually, and a uh, recent area of research, uh, I'd say recent as in the last 10 years, but um, a, a fast expanding area is use, using genomes and DNA to actually identify and see if some type of sequence in your DNA might actually be leading to different types of cancers forming. Uh, this graph just kind of shows what current biomarkers are applicable for. Um, I, I think the main point here is just, uh, in general, cancer biomarkers span across different types of cancers. There's many differences between different types of cancers, it's breast cancer and prostate cancer, lung cancer, things like that, but right now they span more across uh, different types of cancers than one specifically. There are, there are cancers that span specific ones, but um, those are the prevalent types right now. Um, I, I just wanted to give a quick example um, of uh, one type of cancer, oh thank you, <laughs> um, one type of cancer biomarker, uh, just to give you an idea of what it is and what, what it would be. So one example is uh, prostate specific antigen PSA, which is um, a type of a biomarker used to uh, help detect prostate cancer. And it, the way they test for this, it's usually found in um, prostate glands or, or fluids. And one important point I would like to mention though, like many cancer biomarkers, this is still a very developing field. So clinical practitioners don't use this in isolation to indicate or try to test whether a person has cancer or not. Um, they use it as a part of a suite of different tests to help corroborate whether a patient might be likely to develop some kind of cancer. This isn't a, you know, this person has this protein and therefore they're gonna develop cancer. In fact, everybody has this protein, it's just different level amounts that indicate whether a type of cancer is gonna develop or not. So it, it's still a developing field and 
there's many different types of um, use cases that uh, one, one can use. This is one, one example of a type of cancer biomarker. So what I want to show is, now that I've defined, I've kind of shown you what a cancer biomarker is, what's the process that scientists typically use also from a data processing perspective to arrive and detect um, cancer biomarkers and, and use them in an actual use case. So what this is, is this is basically a, a, a pipeline, you could say, for um, identifying different types of uh, proteins and specifically applicable to cancer biomarkers. So I just want to show, uh, go through this and just show you what are the step-by-step -step procedures that a scientist would typically use to try to find a biomarker. So the first step is to collect sample tissue, and actually that's all I can say about that. It's very simple, just collect the tissue and get a hold of a tissue sample. That's probably a lot harder than it, uh, I made it sound. But that's the first step. Um, the second step is to basically, after you've collected the tissue, break it down into its um, protein and peptide components. And people use different types of solutions. Um, there's many enzymes that have uh, capabilities of breaking down tissue samples into its specific components. And that's, that's really the second step, is to take the tissue and break it down to something usable. The third step would be to isolate peptides. And this is, again, specific to um, protein identification. But um, there's different types of machines that will do this for you. So I don't know if you ever remember from your physics class and things like that, but there's uh, tools like you know, mass spectrometry is a very useful uh, tool. It'll, you can take um, different fragments of molecules and run them through magnetic fields, and then it'll mass to charge ratio and all that good stuff will let you decide and determine specific signatures that tell you what that particular fragment is. And so using those types of techniques, you can go from peptides to try to specifically identify what those peptides are. And this data is then stored you know, on, on a computer and in, into a database where you can try to find specific matchings of what, what it is, what's contained inside the tissue samples that you're looking for. The next step would be to, um, and this is one of the key steps, is to, once you've identified the peptides, to actually run that against a database of known toxins. So um, there's many organizations out there that contain full databases for different organisms like human, um, e. coli, different organisms for what are the known toxins, what are the known uh, pr problematic signatures that we're looking for. And so you, you go through this process of taking the proteins and then trying to match them against what you already know to be problematic in, in that particular organism. And then you give it a score and try to identify what you found. The final step is, of course, generating the reports. A lot of data is generated through this process, so uh, many times a lot of the tools, some of the tools I'll be talking about, uh, just generate graphical representations and, and reports to let you identify what it is you found through this entire process of looking at tissue sample and finding out what um, what biomarkers and proteins are identified in that. And again, like many things, this isn't an absolute thing. These are all problem. Uh, these are all probability estimates that tell you whether what the probability is that you found a particular type of peptide fragment. So um, yeah, so, so now that I've uh, kind of explained a little bit about the science behind um, uh, cancer biomarker research, and hopefully that gave you a little bit of an idea, I'd like to talk about a little bit more in depth and about uh, Apache ODT and specifically uh, the data processing technologies. And I'll talk about how that fits in with, with the science application I talked about earlier. So, so what is Apache ODT? I know many of you are very, very familiar with it, but for those of you who are, are not or just interested in a little bit more information about it, um, Apache ODT is um, essentially a data management, um, data processing technology. It's a set of loosely coupled components that work well together to solve many different types of science use cases for um, managing data and processing data and distributing data. Um, across a distributed network. So there's, uh, this, this diagram comes from actually from the ODT uh, webpage, but uh, it, it does a good example of just kind of identifying the core components of ODT in terms of three categories. And the first of those categories 
is the, oh, did I take it off? No, it's still there. Um, the first of those categories is the Catalog and Archive Service, uh, or CAS for short. So CAS is um, a, a subset of a ODT that contains um, essentially a whole list of different components that focus on, um, like the name suggests, cataloging and uh, archiving products. So you have File Manager, which is one of the main interfaces for actually accessing products and accessing uh, metadata about products. Um, there's a Curator, which is, uh, like the name suggests, um, a service which allows you to um, modify metadata and improve it and curate it and um, increase the um, readability and, and usefulness of, of the metadata um, catalog. And, and then there's also Workflow and Resource. And those all work very well together to, to solve, I would say, the data management portion of, of ODT. Um, and, and these are all, again, loosely coupled, so you could just, if you just needed to store files in the basic setup, such as Lucene database or, or Lucene catalog or an RDMS or something, you could just use File Manager if you wanted, or if you wanted to, um, you know, just set up a workflow manager and incorporate with another component, you could just use that. So these are loosely coupled components. Um, the next uh, subcategory is the grid services. And now, uh, this is an area where um, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's a very important part of ODT. Uh, it doesn't get too much limelight, but um, it, it's useful for, um, I would say, the distribution aspect of, of uh, distribution aspect of ODT, which is you have products across a network, and how do you distribute them? How do you query for them um, across this distributed network? And so, um, product and profile provide different types of services, web services, to allow you access remotely organized data and actually search for it. And then the the final subcomponent, um, just utilities. Uh, and I would say, you know, just expanding that definition of utilities, there's many other efforts in ODT have come up in the most recent years. So you can almost think of this as a category for many other applications, including web applications, um, including monitoring. Um, so there's many other kind of uh, small facets of ODT that are, I would say, kind of fit into this external category. So, um, yeah, so those are the um, uh, components of ODT. Now here I've taken the same diagram and just kind of specified in terms of data processing, what are the components that are involved in the data processing aspect of ODT? Um, I would say the two core ones are workflow and um, resource. So workflow manager is, um, workflow for sure, is uh, a component that focuses on how do you, uh, how do you build essentially a pipeline of processing. So you have different types of science algorithms or um, it doesn't even have to be science, but it, it different algorithms or different programs that you want to execute in parallel or in series. And Workflow Manager works to build that into, like the name suggests, a workflow. Resource Manager is um, involved with how do you actually take those workflows and execute them, what's, what's the computational infrastructure like? And so there's a clear separation between those two for a reason. Um, so you can, you can define workflows in one area and you can say how, how I want to run those, which nodes I want to run them in, in a, a second facet. So those are the two kind of core um, data processing components, if, if there's anything you can take away from this. Um, I want to talk. Uh, briefly about a uh, process control system, PCS. So um, this diagram, uh, PCS is, uh, it's a system that's used to, um, I would say, in one way, improve, um, just make it easier to understand your data processing system. So it includes tools to help monitoring, to, to monitor your data processing system, and in a way, allows you to think of these different loosely coupled components as uh, components that work well together. And three of the most important, three important parts of a uh, process control system are file manager, workflow manager, and resource manager. And I talked a little bit about the, uh, the second two. But this diagram just kind of shows that 
you know, file manager um, and workflow manager, resource manager, they all interact together um, to help facilitate a data processing solution. So let's go a little bit more into depth in, into each one. So file manager um, is the, the basic, at its core, it's a Lucene catalog that lets you just query for um, metadata or query for product locations on your file-based system. And that can be extended to, you can store your data in a database system or you can store it in um, whatever kind of endpoint you want, but by default, it's, it's a Lucene catalog that allows you to store metadata. And, whoa. Um, so th this diagram I thought would be useful to show. Um, uh, this is a diagram, I believe Chris Matman uh, drew this up, so I want to give him credit for this. Um, this diagram shows the, the idea of a process control system, PCS, in terms of how those three components I was talking about interact. So file manager is, is highlighted there on, on the left. And as you can see, um, it interacts with both the uh, workflow manager and with, um, in this case, you see the crawler. So you could think of a process control system as uh, you need to get a hold of products first, and right? And crawler is actually a component that helps with that. Let's crawl crawls directory structures and obtains references to products. File manager stores information about those products in terms of metadata, where they're located, what's some information about them, and feeds references to the products or metadata about the products to workflows, which I'll talk about in a second. So that's kind of the position of file manager within this scheme. Um, to go into uh, workflow manager, um, let me zoom in there again. Uh, workflow manager, uh, you could think of it representing this giant blob here. So its role in, in the process control system would be to es essentially just wrap science algorithms together and create, create the, the overall algorithm of how to process data, what to do with input data and produce an output. So here there's a term called PGE um, that was mentioned a couple times. PGE stands for, I believe, like product generation ex executive. Um, I think it's a NASA term, um, so some of you might not be familiar with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, it is, it, it's a term that essentially what it means is create a wrapper for some program. So PGEs let you take external programs if it's written in Python, Java, um, Bash, you know, whatever. Uh, it lets you wrap those uh, programs using an XML type of configuration where you can say, you can specify what uh, metadata to handle as input, what to do with that particular algorithm, how to execute, and what to do with the output it generates. So you can essentially wrap your external programs in PGEs and define an XML-based policy that says how those PGEs fit together in terms of a workflow or sets of workflows if you, if you have a parallel system. And that's the role of the workflow manager. And then, of course, it sends off the jobs to dun, 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 resource manager. Um, so resource manager, uh, its role, like I mentioned earlier, is to be in charge of the execution of where you want to be running these workflows. And so you can see here on the left, there's a list of computing resources. And so what that means is uh, you can run your uh, specific parts of your workflows on different, um, different machines or different uh, clusters. And so that's the resource manager is in charge of, through XML configuration, again, determining how you want to run your different workflows. OK, so hopefully that was a pretty in-depth uh, introduction to ODT data processing. Now what I want to do is connect those two parts of the talk together and talk a little bit about an actual use case where we're using ODT components to solve, or t not to solve, but to advance um, uh, cancer research and try to solve an actual um, problem that we've been facing. So to, to, before I, I, I start with that, let me just introduce what the project overall is. It, there's a project called um, EDRN, Early Detection Research Network, and I think Dan had referenced this in an earlier talk today, but EDRN is an organization that is focused on, it, it's a subsidiary of um, NCI, or NIH actually, National Institute of Health, but it's in charge with advancing uh, 
what I was talking about earlier, which is cancer biomarker research, trying to find clinically applicable biomarkers that can be used by actual clinicians in the future to um, help uh, detect cancer at its earliest stages. So that's really the charter mission of the EDRN. And um, at JPL, we actually manage the information um, uh, information system aspects of it. Um, so uh, as a sub-project within the EDRN, we've been working recently on a project called LabCAS, which is, um, at its essence, it's a data management system, uh, much like what you, uh, other th projects you've heard about today, but it's a data management system targeted for e EDRN researchers for their experimental products. So we actually have a data management system in place for published products already. If a researcher identifies you know, biomarkers or some kind of finding, they publish those results in a paper and they want to make the data sets available associated with those results. We have a data management system for that. LabCAS is an extension of that um, data management system to focus on um, pre-publication data, experimental data, which ex researchers find valuable and they might want to share with other researchers, but um, they currently are just storing them in their own facilities and transferring them through other means. So that's the focus of LabCAS as a data management solution. Proteomics Pipeline is a parallel effort along with LabCAS where what we are doing essentially is adding on centralized uh, dating pro data processing uh, facilities for, for LabCAS. So after users have actually uploaded data sets, experimental data sets, the idea of Proteomics Pipeline is to allow them to process those data sets and produce analytical results that they can share with their colleagues or just use for their own purposes. And um, of course, we're using uh, ODT components for that. So um, this, uh, this diagram uh, might be a little bit complicated, but just to give uh, an idea of what it means, this, this diagram essentially shows what, um, it's actually a little bit hard to see, what it shows is what ODT data processing comp components, o ODT components in general we're using on the top versus how we're using them in which state of our data, pro data management system we're using them at. So as you can see, you know, we have a specific process that we're using in terms of uh, our data management solution. We're taking, first getting a hold of the projects, putting them in our staging area, archiving them, um, you know, uh, then uh, curating them, processing them, and then finally distributing them. And so those are the steps in our pipeline. And then on the top you can see we're using file manager, we're using um, workflow manager, resource manager, crawler at different stages to perform different functions. So that's the idea, you know, again, in terms of modularity, you can use it for, you can use components for a specific process and uh, send data in between. So, um, so yeah, I, I thought it'd be useful actually just to give you a quick demonstration of what LabCAS is apart from just kind of show the architecture. Um, so let me do that in a second. So, okay, hopefully that comes up. Okay, so this is, um, this is the LabCAS current uh, user interface. And what it basically shows is a couple of different capabilities. Um, and along with that backend or front end versions of backend ODT components. So what you see here are, this is also our test site by the way. Um, what you see here are available data sets that researchers or actually in this case me have uploaded. So what you can see is basically through an, um, through an upload tool we can capture end user data from different research institutions. They fill out this form, they have um, different kinds of uh, methods to upload the data, and once the data has actually been transferred to our system, um, you see a, a rendering of a data set, and one can then view individual products as a part of that data set. And um, for example, down here, uh, these are actual raw uh, specimen files manage different details of that data set, and then um, 
those are some of the basic capabilities we're supporting right now. And as well as I was mentioning, uh, the pur one of the purposes of LabCAS is also to, to get a hold of user data as early as possible to try to facilitate um, connecting it with our other data management solution, which is called ECAS. And that's for, again, publication specific data, already, already published data. So there's um, different tools we're working on to help uh, take experimental data where users can basically see a list of their laboratory data, modify metadata about it, um, run it through pipelines, and then finally push it to our final cataloging system. So this kind of just renders, uh, gives you a quick glimpse of what the user interface looks like. But many of these components, these, these uh, data set lists are taken from um, information obtained from the file manager along with Solar. Um, Andrew actually has a talk about that, he'll talk about later. But there's many, the, the point is many ODT and there's many components pushing and supporting this in the back end. So that's a quick example of that. Um, go back to here. Okay. All right, so how about the, yeah, I'll talk about the Proteox pipeline a little bit more in depth now. So I was mentioning it's a, it's a system that allows um, the, the centralization of analysis. So one of the issues that many researchers have faced, and I'm sure this is applicable across different disciplines, is you have input data, raw data that you want to process and analyze, but you have your own set of algorithms, but there's many other researchers out there with their different sets of algorithms that can also process your data. And uh, an, a, a good way of doing continuing on your research is to try out different analysis methods on your same input data and compare and contrast the results. Many times that's difficult to do because there's an entire pipeline chain of tools that are necessary to download, install, configure on your local system to try to get external tools working. And so if you want to analyze your data on using different methods, that can be really difficult to do uh, if, you know, if you don't have the time to set up all these different types of tools on your system. So LabCAS, or sorry, Proteomics Pipeline is trying to address that by centralizing the algorithms in, in a single place where input data products can be processed. And one example case that we've started with is a, uh, a set of um, tools, essentially, that form a, a data processing algorithm from the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And this is basically, that, that pipeline diagram that I showed earlier with all the different arrows and all that, uh, that was, um, essentially a representation of this algorithm in a way. So you have input raw data and you have different database, database information of known toxins, things like that. And you run it through these analysis tools where you match your raw specimens against those known um, toxins and generate results and then archive that information into LabCAS. So this is an example of one algorithm, one data processing so solution that we've implemented in um, LabCAS. Now, the idea in general, though, is to take this type of algorithm and implement it as an actual workflow. So the way we've been doing that is using Workflow Manager, we've taken those individual steps and represented them as e each one of those blue boxes represents a workflow task. And so in our case, ours is just sequential. There's no parallelization. But you have individual workflow tasks that perform a specific function like uh, looking up the uh, looking up information about the raw specimens against um, a database of known toxins and then passing that on to um, a program that generates reports and analysis reports essentially and each one of those um, tasks are represented in XML configuration files so this kind of shows how you take an algorithm and if you want to actually implement as a workflow you go through these steps in Workflow Manager to just wrap each one as a workflow task or as a, as an, as a PGE and connect them together. And that's basically your, your uh, workflow. Um, oh, okay, so I'm just gonna give a quick demonstration of uh, the pipeline. Um, so let me just reload this. Okay, so this is just a quick example of the idea I was talking about earlier, which is the centralization of workflows. 
So the idea is after users have uploaded their data or their data sets, if they want to run an analysis algorithm on it, one can basically select among a series of different types of workflows and try to analyze their data using each one of those. So I'm going to select one, the use case that we have here, and select which um, data products I want to run in. These are all defaults. Um, OK, I'll just put in my email. Um, and if I hit Submit here, um, OK, it did something. So OK, so this actually immediately transferred us to uh, a page called the Workflow Monitor, which is another tool that comes straight out of ODT. In this case, it's been a little bit customized. But it shows currently running workflows that have been submitted to the system. And so this is part of the, um, the PCS tool suite, which allows you to see currently running um, workflows that you've submitted. And so in this case, there's just a quick rendering of, uh, oh, that's been running for a while. Um, so this is the workflow that we just submitted a, a few seconds ago. And it's in, um, if, if you were to basically see uh, which stage it's at, you'll click on um, the rendering of the workflow. And you can see there's actually quite a few steps. The diagram I'm showing you, there's many steps involved, each of which you can find out more information about um, in terms of Give it a second, there you go. And so this is kind of, um, this is information about each workflow task. So this is a lot of detail, I know, but uh, this is just kind of to show you that all those different pieces are kind of connected and they can, uh, you can get information about workflows and each in workflow task, even from a web app. So that shows uh, you know, submission of, of different workflow tasks and an example of how we're actually processing the data. And by the way, I don't think we'll have enough time to sh show the end result of this. It usually takes about 30, 40 minutes to process. But the results of that, um, that uh, pipeline process will appear as a new data set here, and which you can use to actually browse and see what products you've developed and download them, and that kind of thing. So the idea is you take input products, run it through the pipeline, and you can generate a new data set. All right. So um, to go on to, to the last portion of the talk, uh, I want to talk about if, if you're interested in, in this and if you're interested in setting up a data processing system on your, uh, on your own, how would, you, how would you go about this? And how would you replicate the steps that I showed and try to you know, address the science use case yourself? So um, in the most um, simplest terms, what are the steps involved, just to recap, that, that, are, that are involved in, in trying to set up a data processing system? So the first is essentially what you want to do is set up the, the PCS framework. So you want to get a hold of uh, different ODT components like file manager, workflow manager, resource manager, uh, crawler. And those are kind of the core set of components that you'd want to use to, to set up your data processing system. And you download them and, and kind of install them and configure them. And the next step would be to take those components and after you've actually installed them, configured them, and set up all your um, environment variables and connected, connected the dots essentially in terms of installation, you would take your science algorithms and implement that within the workflow. So take the different steps of your science algorithm implement that as workflow tasks and connect them in whatever type of configuration you wanted using uh, PGEs. And then finally, the step, final step would be to um, you know, configure user interface to make it simpler for a user to, to launch workflows and to um, see the results and render results. So those are essentially the, at the most basic level the steps involved in setting up a data processing system <coughs> using OODT. I know you might be wondering, is there an easier method? Because it, it honestly took me quite a long time to get that up and running. Um, so there, uh, th there's a lot of work that's been going into um, trying to simplify the process of getting up and running as a new user of ODT and setting up your own data management system as a subset of that, a data processing system. So. Uh, one of the things I want to just kind of show is how one would um, how one would 
get up and running using a tool called Radix, which is, I'm not sure what that stands for, honestly, but um, I'm sure it's something cool. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's basically, uh, at its core, it, what it is is a tool that allows you to get up and running quickly using a full distribution of Apache ODT. Well, not a full, but um, the core components that I mentioned in, in the PCS um, uh, system. And uh, the idea is, um, to, to steal a quote from Cameron, the idea is uh, convention over configuration, where you want to just get up and running as quickly as possible, and you, you don't necessarily want to spend the time to configure everything yourself and customize in your own type of directory structure and placement on disk, but uh, you can just assume a certain type of directory structure and just get up and running quickly. And um, so, uh, in terms of details, how this works, it uses um, a Maven archetype where you can use Apache Maven to generate the product directory structure, use it to build it, and it's pre-configured using preset environment variables to get up and running. So, um, so actually using it, it's not a lot of steps at all. Um, I've, I've used it for other projects, actually. So uh, the first step, uh, or first portion of this is basically just using Maven to get a hold of the information you need to actually generate the project directory structure and um, generate the tarball, which is your data management system. And then, of course, starting it, um, starting the data management system. So uh, I'm actually going to be brave today and try, try that out <laughs> in real time. Um, so just to give you an idea of how, how you would do that yourself. And um, part of this was demonstrated la last time at ApacheCon, but there's been improvements and uh, a little bit easier access in terms of getting this up and running. So I wanted to demonstrate that as well. Be brave. All right, yeah. always am. <laughs> All right, so the first step is basically, um, oh, just to prove to you that, you know, I'm not just making stuff up. Here's the, what I'm gonna demo, and it's clearly not working. It's the final actual web app. and. Uh, ODT. See, there's no ODT components running. Um, so I'm also being honest as well as brave. All right, so here's the first step. And the first step is getting hold of the Apache, uh, of, uh, sorry, getting hold of the um, Maven archetype and basically generating the um, project directory where you're going to build your data management solution. So let me go ahead and just press enter on that. And, and so what it's doing. Um, is, uh, well, I mean, what does Maven always do? Just download the internet. But um, it's, it's, it's downloading that, and, <laughs> and um, I'm just going to say yes on the default structure. So it's basically what it's done is it's generated the Apache Maven um, archetype, and uh, it's generated a directory where um, our basic components are stored. So if you see here, these are the components that have been generated automatically and pre-configured. So what I'm going to do now is just build that um, data management solution. And that includes a couple of different components. It includes uh, its basic onset file manager, um, workflow manager, resource manager, uh, I believe crawler, um, and then uh, some other tools like PCS monitor, as well as a couple of web apps. So that allows you to essentially get uh, data management system pre-built where you can just kind of get it uh, viewable to a user. And what I'm going to demo in a second is actually uh, the, it also comes pre-configured with some operational user interfaces that you can use to monitor workflows and you can use to view and see what kinds of uh, files are on your um, uh, what types of products are in your file manager catalog. So, oh, cool, it's actually finished. All right, um, so what I'm gonna do now is change into the, uh, or actually I'm gonna create, uh, yeah, I'm gonna create a deployment directory. So what, it's, what step I just accomplished is basically building the tarball that is my data management solution. Now what I'm gonna do is actually deploy that tarball into um, a predefined deployment directory. And so I'm just going to untar that uh, pre-created tarball. And um, CD into that. And let's, uh, I'm just going to start that. Um, 
And ODT Start is basically part of Radix. It's just a simplified one-step tool to let you start many of the services involved, including the web applications. So that um, should have started the uh, data management system. I'm just going to reload that. OK, so this is a snapshot of um, kind of the front end user interface for uh, an operator to just see the status of their data management system and data processing system. So at its core, it contains, again, you know, file manager, oops, um, yeah, file manager, um, workflow manager, resource manager, um, some other tools. But as you can see now, there's, there's, this is the file manager um, catalog. There's no products because this is a fresh installation. But uh, there would be if I ingested some new products into the system. Workflow manager, there's obviously no workflows installed, uh, but you would see status of workflows if you had actually launched them. So that is, um, yeah, that's essentially just what you can get up and running very quickly using it. There's a, a couple of steps. The next step after you actually get this up and running and, and have your uh, data system viewable um, is to, let me go back here. Uh, the next step would be to customize your deployment. So this, this makes it easy to get up and running quickly. The next step is talk to your scientists, talk to your use case, talk to your customers essentially and try to figure out what are the algorithms involved in your data processing system and identify those into separate workflow tasks and of course figure out whether you want you have a parallel data processing solution or a serial, that kind of thing. And then isolate those workflow tasks, implement them as P PGEs, like I mentioned, um, and then you have your, your workflows, essentially, that you want to run. Next step would be, in terms of resource management, figure out what are your machines that you want to deploy your workflows on. Are they just a single box? Are there multiple nodes involved? Is it a cloud solution? What, what type of deployment strategy in terms of how you want to execute your workflows um, uh, determine, de determine the details of that, essentially. And then finally, it would be uh, the final step would be an archival strategy in terms of how do you want to store the projects, products that are involved in your data management solution, what's the policy like, what is the metadata like that like. In fact, I, I would, this is actually out of order. I would suggest your archival strategy is the first step that you want to um, take in terms of your data management system and data processing system. But those would be the next steps after you get up and running using Radix to, to get a data management system up and running. So that's, that's my talk. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, there's some just additional contact information. Um, uh, I just want to you know, say thanks to all the contributors on, on the slideshow. There's many other people involved um, uh, in this project, but um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks. And if you have any questions, uh, just let me know. I'd be happy to take them. Please use the mic. I thought I'd be loud enough, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, I'm more curious, like, you know, are you guys like working with any, the XML you mentioned about the workflow description? Yeah. Is that based on any standard or is it ODT specific there? So I guess if I understand your question correctly, um, you're asking how do you take the information from the scientists and implement in the workflows? Yeah, the, the grab. What's the contract between the scientists and the ODT system, like in, uh, when they represent their, when they describe their problem? Yeah. So I would say it's, right now the way, the process in which we do that is the scientists have an idea of what the execution steps are involved, and they communicate that using just simple methods, like a slideshow or a diagram in that case. So that diagram is actually um, one of the bases that we use to figure out what are the steps involved in the workflow we want to implement. So in, in terms of a, a standard procedure, it's just at this stage it's very basic in terms of communicating um, a different type of uh, workflow. But the next step in terms of once you have that information, some of the tools that I talked about, do you have, you get input from the scientists, then you represent it using XML configuration and, and workflow manager. You're easily able to render that using some of the tools that, um, uh, like, like workflow monitor and things like that. And 
that allows you to kind of contrast. So I would say the contract is getting the scientist view, implement that, implementing that in XML, generating our own graph, and then kind of comparing and contrasting. The short end, oh God. The short answer is uh, no, it's not based on any standard. And uh, we looked at a bunch of standards and I didn't like them because they were bloated <coughs> and I didn't think anyone would write anything in them. We looked at BPEL, we looked at a whole bunch of other things. The ODT workflows are captured in basic XML, uh, captures control flow and data flow, differentiates them by tasks, by data flow dependencies on those tasks and then control flow dependencies for the tasks. Branch and bounds are captured in modern versions of the ODT system explicitly. Prior to that, they are captured implicitly in the way that people constructed like conditional workflows or preconditions and things like that, as well as the fact that the workflow manager is an event-based system. And uh, when events come into the system, you can kick off multiple things at once and then you can recombine them at the end, kind of like the way MapReduce works through conditionals you know, on things. But in the later version, of uh, workflow for ODT that I'll talk about tomorrow. This stuff is supported explicitly. But, but this is really the difference between whether or not, so what Rishi talked about today was a production-oriented workflow. Scientists don't touch what he does most of the time because he's running it at scale and they just communicated to him the way to do it and he set it up. But if this were an interactive, more discovery thing, that would be more important to us and we'd care about that more in this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Chris is short answer. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> anything else, my friend? Uh, um, Rishi, I think one other thing too is is I think the other part of that that answer that question is what we observed in the in the NASA science realm and what we observed in in the NIH science realm are, are vastly different. The, the NASA people are, are used to writing sort of prototype sandbox um, algorithms that we can go and integrate. The, um, with working with the NIH guys, this is all kind of new ground mm -hmm. for them. And so when we go talk to them about writing workflows, we, we've got to explain the concept of, of directed graph kind of workflow to them. And that's, that's been part of the experience. So part of this is, is plowing new ground and figuring out how do we relate what we do at NASA to what we actually relate to the NIH and trying to get people on the same page. So how, how is the resource scheduling uh, happening in ODT? ODT in general or in this use case specifically? In, like in this use case. Yeah. So um, in terms of our deployment, uh, Chris mentioned it's kind of a production deployment. What we're using is basically it's two nodes. Um, so we have, because our tool set is essentially composed of Windows-based tools and um, platform-specific tools. So we have essentially two <coughs> nodes for one Windows-based tools and one for Linux-based tools. And depending on different parts of the workflow, some tools only work on Windows, some only work on Linux, uh, the workflow manager um, identifies or specifies which platform those specific tasks should work on and shoots them off to the resource manager, which sends the job to a, a different machine. So yeah, basically it's, it's kind of a single node execution at this so point. Is that part of PSC? What? DSC? In, there was PCS. PCS. Oh, PCS. Yeah. Uh, PCS, so PCS, I would say, it, it's still kind of a concept I'm almost uh, coming to understand, but it's, I would say, uh, resource manager is, manager is part of the PCS suite of tools. PCS allows you to get information about the, pro the way in which you're processing data, right? So um, it contains monitoring applications, and different information about um, how data is kind of going through your system. Resource management is part of that picture, so it, it includes tools about which nodes are cur currently active, which nodes are up, and um, which nodes are potential jobs can be sent to. But I would say it's part of that, that general concept. So, so PCS is aggregate tools that bring together information from multiple CAS services or file manager or workflow manager. So if you wrote a tool that combines information from workflow and file manager, it ends up in the PCS package. So the two or three major things we have in there, as Reese mentioned, is like a health monitoring service, which connects to all the different services as well as like the crawlers and things like that and monitors their status and then provides like rest and JSON stuff back. And then there's one for provenance 
because it's a multi-file manager, workflow manager kind of aggregator thingy. And so that's PCS. The answer to your question, Sam, is that I think the information you're looking for is stored in the specification of the workflow job. So when Rishi curates this information about the workflow you know, task or whatever, he puts this should go to the particular queue that's Linux, or this should go to the one that's Windows. And then the resource manager decides based on that workflow metadata, which that's again turned into resource manager information, which one to task it to. Yeah. Yeah, that, that almost, yeah, kind of just emphasizing that point, it, it all becomes part of the metadata. So it's all kind of part of this giant chunk of metadata that's sent off to these tools, and then the tools decide what they want to do with it. But which node you want to run, or which type of queue you want to run it in um, is part of uh, the metadata for a particular workflow task. Okay, uh, if there are any other questions, we can take them more on break. So it's break right now afterwards. Otherwise, we can thank Rishi. Thanks. Thanks.